Yes, uh, welcome. This is our inaugural Applied Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Variety Show. And we welcome Mate from Mushoeshoe Properties. You are our inaugural guest, so that will remain <laughs> Thank you so as much. Such. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you for the invitation. Uh, you are welcome. You're welcome. Um, as I said, this is our Applied uh, Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Variety Show. This is the show that is based on our idea, which says that we inform and entertain, we develop and empower, we, um, uh, I mean, we, uh, we uh, empower and support, we develop and educate, we associate and network. That is the idea. The Commercial Global Online Channels is a group of platforms that we use to reach out to stakeholders like yourself, Mate, and we are, we are happy to have you here. Now, I'm joined in this conversation by my colleagues, uh, Maynard Maisela, who is an entrepreneur himself. Uh, Tendani Munonoka is also an entrepreneur. We will be joined uh, later by Akona Tuguza and uh, our brother Ruben uh, Rambuda. They are all entrepreneurs. Okay, we, like it, uh, we like it when entrepreneurs are speaking to entrepreneurs. That's why the, the program is called Applied Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Variety Show. That okay. way it applied uh, means exactly that. We want practitioners like yourself to come and inspire us, inspire our viewers. We want to talk about the ecosystem of entrepreneurship. And of course, it varies in the sense that we talk all sectors. Today, we're yeah. going to focus on property sector, or you call it real estate sector. Sure. But before we going to hear more about you, I'm going to ask the colleagues just to shortly introduce themselves, say a few words about their their own uh, uh, their own companies, uh, so that you feel comfortable that you're talking to people that understand the entrepreneurship. Maybe let's start with Maynard. Maynard, just a few words about yourself and the type of business you are in. And we welcome my uh, colleague you. Michael. I think he was just checking in. Yeah. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, as you said, my name is Maynard Maisela. I'm based in Boxtech here in South Africa. I'm an entrepreneur in a branding sphere. Uh, I'm an executive director for a company called Maisela Corporate Branding. We specialize mainly on your embroidery, on your vinyl stickers. Uh, we do a lot of branding for companies, for individuals, so that is our field of uh, survival. Okay. Oh, thank you. Wow. Thanks, Vati. My neighbor. <laughs> oh, are you from Boxman? Yeah. Wow, that's lovely. So many neighbors. Yeah, no, I think I'm happy. From where? Which side? But you will introduce yourself then. I'll, I'll yes, keep I'll it from there. All right, okay. Well, um, thank you, Sam. Um, Hi to my colleague, hi Mapu, hi Minet. Um Dendani Mnonoka. I am the founder of um, Dendani Cultural Society. Um, it's a cultural a concept group that we promote culture, uh, heritage and arts, sports, you know, everything you name it. I'm based in Limpopo in a village called Madendita. Um, that is where I am, and I'm also a director at Page Medical Solutions, a consulting company for medical um, practitioners. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So great. Great stuff. Uh, 
Mate, perhaps we can just start by hearing about you. I'm very interested in how you came into the industry, but perhaps just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get to the actual uh, talk around your business. All right, so my name is Mate Mushreshwe, as uh, Dr. Tim has already uh, mentioned. So uh, I'm a property entrepreneur. My business, I've got an office in Rosebank and one in Rosebank also. But how I came into the industry when I started to is very funny because I was working for a company called, I don't know if you know Masmat, as a receptionist. Um, while working there, one day came across a, an advert whereby they said, write your, you can write your own check. And that advert was about real estate. And then at the time, because I just had it, my, my first child and my income was not enough for me to raise a child and to also to take care of my mother and my sister who were all dependent on me financially. So then I decided to take the risk, call the lady, go for an interview. And then when I got there, uh, the lady said to me, firstly, that I'm young. It's a very difficult industry. And thirdly, I will not survive. She rather gave me another job as a receptionist, but now in a real estate company. So that's how I started. See, our colleague uh, 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 Akona has just joined. Akona, are you ready? Or you just, I can see you just setting up there. Akona, are you ready to talk? Uh, otherwise, we we want to start. Yeah. So perhaps uh, let's let's take it from there, and I'm going to ask the colleagues to to engage with you on this. Uh, it is not it's an unusual way to be introduced into entrepreneurship. Yeah. True. Sure. So at that point, you, when you were introduced to this industry, what thoughts were preoccupying you at that point in time? Did you just upfront say, I'm going for it? Or what, what did you have to do to convince yourself that this is the direction you want to go? I actually didn't even know there's anything called real estate in my life, to be quite honest, because obviously I was born in Katoho. And where I'm coming from, I've never had anybody who's an estate agent. In my family, uh, nobody has ever bought a property. So the word property or even real estate did not even exist in my vocabulary at that particular time. The only reason I think I wanted to take that leap of faith was, number one, that advert that wrote, write your own check because I needed a financial breakthrough at that particular time in my life. Things were very tough uh, to raise a child and to also take care of two other people. So that's what drove me to be able to jump into real estate, not even know what the sector is all about. Mm, wow. Maynard, is this sounding familiar? Yeah, no, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very inspired from here, in fact, if I can say. I mean, from reception needs to a property industry, it's, it's actually a, a, a strain, I can imagine. So, you know, but, you know, it's fine. We will engage with her as we go on. Um, I, I just want to know, like, how did she break through that industry? Because I, I believe maybe most of women, they will say maybe the industry is, is not, it's mainly known to be, a predominantly white people so as, 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 a, as a white woman i mean how did you break through from receptionist to as, that a, as a white not as a as white a, woman as a black woman and, and, and not as a white woman she didn't even have those privileges to be true. I mean, <laughs> that is so wow. true so, yeah. yeah well Wow. So, so if you can tell us, I mean, how did you make it? I mean, really, it sounds magical. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, when I got to that office, I remember going oh. home to tell my mom that, Mom, I've got a job, and the office is full of old 
want white people. I'm the only young black person. <laughs> and my mom said, do you think you're going to cope? And I said, mom, I have to take that chance because we need to get out of this poverty cycle. And that lady said, if I can prove to her that I can, I'm strong enough to be able to go into the industry, they will give me that opportunity. <laughs> so now what happened is that um, I've always been the kind of a person who likes to initiate things. So it happened one day as a receptionist, uh, there was a guy actually who was supposed to take a client to see a new development in Fosloras. That was way in 2005. And it happened that particular day, the agent who was supposed to take this client wasn't there. And this client kept on calling and calling. And as a receptionist, I went to my manager and said, there's no one uh, at the office. Uh, this particular agent is not here. Heather is not here, actually. I am willing to take this client to Fosloas because it's not far from where I live. And then maybe if you can just give me the address of that particular new house, I can get the address and then I can maybe, you might just tell me what I need to do. So my manager was J.K. Newman. She said, are you sure? Maria, are you sure? They used to call me Maria. I said, no, ma'am, I'm sure. So, okay, fine. Here's the keys. This is the address. I went and I searched for this address. I met with this lady who was working for ESCOM. And she looked at the house. She said, I like the house. I want to buy it. So I was like, you want to buy it? So I called my manager. Ma Madam, she said she wants to buy it. Oh, Madam said, come, come back to the office. Come, 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 come now. I drove back. Luckily, I had a car. My mom, actually, when she was returned, she bought me a car. So I had a car. We drove back to Boxback at Sunward Park. The lady signed the deal. And... I didn't even know that uh, as, a, as an estate agent back then, when you close a deal, it's such a big thing. So on a Monday meeting, and then people were clapping for me, the receptionist at Hall Real Estate just sold the house. So the news actually traveled, actually spread around up until it reached our CEO, which was Chris Morris at the time. So Chris Morris wanted to see this firstly black, very young girl, who just started and immediately she sold the house. So he went to see me at my office and he said that, uh, you look like you've got potential and we would like to help you to study further. Maybe you can come and work at the head office in finance department. Mm -hmm. Then my manager said, don't take that opportunity. If you want to change your, your life, become an estate agent. Then I said, okay, fine, I'll be an estate agent. But then I'll, I'll only do it part time. So I started being a, a well, there's something we call a, a, a show sitter whereby you sit for other agents on a weekend. So when they do their show houses, you are the one who's there on a, on a Saturday and Sunday welcoming guests, give me them flyers for the agents. So I started doing that. And funny enough, my presence in that office started attracting black people. So I, I asked myself, because I want to make this happen for me. What can I do? So I realized that uh, where I'm coming from at uh, Mass Mart, at Builders Warehouse now, I used to meet a lot of clients there and I had a very good relationship with people. So I said, man, I can actually send an SMS to a friend of mine and an email and ask them to send it to their network. And people actually did that. And out of that, I started getting referrals and people started to buy. Wow. So you, so, so your first house that you sold was in the township? My first house was in the township in Fort Lawrence Extension 6. At, that was 2005. Wow. As a receptionist. And, and, and you, you were just going to show this person the house? I was just being a good employee. <laughs> I was just being a good employee, a good receptionist, not knowing that that would change my, my life, actually. Yeah. Mm. In every business, there's a language, you know, that it's yes. used and you know how to... You do, you, it was your first time. How do you explain, how do you convince the lady to say, you know, at, um, beside her liking the place, but the language on its own? How did you get that right? I did nothing. On that particular house, I did nothing. All I did was to open the door. 
And she went around, she said, I like the house. That's all I did. I didn't do anything, to be quite honest. I'd be lying if I said mm. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't have any training at that time at all. Yeah. Yeah. And later on, did you acquire any any training? I know they offer um, uh, some training, some courses. Yes, yes. Yes. clients and all that. Yeah, so then what happened is that back in the 2005 and six, before the new regulations, what you needed to do, you had two options. It's either you become an intern estate agent for a year, and then after a year, you qualify to be a full state tax agent. Or you go, you, bite your, you write your board exams, multiple choice, and then that's it. That's what, that was the old regulations. So that's what I did. But however, with the new regulation that came in 2009, all of us needed to go and get a full qualification, which was NQF level four and NQF level five. And you did that now so far? Yes, I've done that. Those were actually sponsored by Service Theta. Mm. Mm. Yeah, those were maybe, like learnerships. Maybe just take us through the development stages that you've gone through to be where you are now. I assume you are a pro now in this industry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still learning. So what happened is that in the year of 2008, early, my manager, Jackie Newman, left uh, the company. And I knew that she was my cheerleader. So with her leaving, I didn't know what I was going to do without this woman who's been a very great mentor in my life. I then realized that maybe because I've closed very good sales, I think at, before I left, I had commission, which was about close to 400,000, if not 350,000 before tax. I decided maybe I can actually take that money and start my own business. But I didn't know that South Africa was actually heading for recession <laughs> in 2008 when I started. So I opened my, my business. I was excited. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm now I'm going to focus in the township. I'm going to come to Katloho. I'm going to give people a good service. The service that I used to see white people get in Sunrod Park, I'm going to bring it all to the township with this all knowledge that I have. And then Six months down the line, hey, I realized this thing is very difficult. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. Mm -mm -mm. The money that I had wasn't going to sustain me for that long. So what I did, I have moved back home so I can be able to, 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 to cut some of the costs that I had. Because by then, I already moved into my a place. I had two cars, so I decided I will sell one car. We left, I'll pay off one car use the other one and then move back home. I moved back home with my mom again. I started my business in my two room. My mom had two back rooms. That's where I started. And then I actually looked around the township market the way it is. And then I wanted to find gaps and opportunities. So I did not have the marketing resources. I not, didn't have enough money to market. And my thinking was that what would be the easiest way for me to market myself without spending any money? So I then said, mm, because there are township malls and there are banks, and definitely banks, they need to, they've got a sales target in terms of bonds that they need to reach. So I then started approaching NetBank. I spoke to the manager that I'm an estate agent. Can we do a collaboration whereby we actually do some sort of like um uh, what is i wouldn't say it's a sh it's a show but like promotion whereby inside the mall and inside their banner i will come and show the houses that i'm selling and then if my clients are interested then they will do the bond application and that actually that relationship worked very well for me it actually helped me because i did not have the money for marketing so with that relationship, I managed to do a lot of promotions in most malls. I did Shahazi um, Mall, I did Naledi Mall, I did um, one in Jimistin. It gave me the exposure. And also because I was associated with a reputable bank, it gave me credibility that people can trust me, even though it was my first time running a business. But because I'm promoting with NetBank, People assume that I'm a well-established business, but I was just as I was just starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Wow. Uh, so did your mom become part of your business, seeing that you took one of her rooms and converted it into office? No, my mom didn't. <laughs> my mom, no, no, no. She wasn't going to be able to work for me. So what I did, there was a lady at the church. So her name was Sheila. And I said, Sheila, man, come and work with me. I'll pay you 1.5. And she said, okay, sister, we'll come. So I worked with Sheila. She will answer the calls. And then I will be out there looking for clients and looking for stocks. So that's what I did. And then when the leadership came of Service Theater, then I ask her that you must come and also uh, involve with this service seat and leadership so that you can also get the qualification. Plus, a uh, service seat was also paying us a certain stipend. So I didn't have to pay anymore because that 1.5 came from service seat. So for the first two years of my business, I didn't pay any salary after that. Mm. Mm. Wow, Mate, you know, your, your, your journey is just, so complicated if i can say and and very motivational in a way looking at where you started in 2008 during the recession and come again 2020 is pandemic i mean i i i i, be, I believe maybe come 2020 pandemic you have already developed an elephant skin you know the this kind yes. of uh, yes, yes. I, 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 how do you balance the two the recession and the pandemic which one maybe tends to be the worst on you, maybe on, on your business? I would say the recession, obviously, it made me to think outside the box. Because back then, nobody knew who I, who I was. 2020, at least, I had some sort of stability in terms of how I handled my finances. But back then, I did not have a mentor. <laughs> I didn't know anyone. So I needed to develop the entrepreneurial skill to survive. I needed to survive and to still provide for my family as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. No, you you mentioned, you mentioned a skill. You, you mentioned de developing a skill for somebody who wants to start, who wants to be a real estate agent. What skill did you apply? Uh, if you're saying you're developing a skill to be an entrepreneur to survive through um for you that made you to come to be where you are today what do you say to a newcomer a new beginner i think what i can say to anybody who wants to start whether to be an estate agent or to be an entrepreneur is that firstly you need to believe in you that's the first person you need to the best relationship you can have is the relationship between yourself because you're going to need yourself when everything fails and secondly you need to build relationships i think what made me to be where i am today is that i have managed the skill to build relationships throughout my career i have managed to build partnership where i see that i don't have the capacity I will always position myself with somebody who has a better capacity and credibility, and that will help me. It will boost me also as a person. So partnerships are crucial for any entrepreneur. They are very crucial. Uh, there was a time where I, when I started actually buying houses on auction, and I know that few of my deals were actually funded by certain attorneys because I knew at that particular time, I did not have the financial resource to go and now and start buying properties which are, require a lot of money. So partnership is at the center of everything, partnership. So tell us, yeah. just, just educate us a little bit about uh, the, this industry. Uh, we, we, we refer to our company as uh, uh, Mushu Properties. But you also seem to be distinguishing between properties and real estate. Uh, I thought they are one and the same thing. Just, just educate <laughs> us there a little bit. Okay, no, real estate is everything. Um, when I mean real estate is that um, real estate can be commercial. Real estate can be graveyard plots. Real estate can be hospitality, which is a hotel. It's still real estate. Real estate can be a, a church. A structure of a church is still part of real estate. So that's what I, when I mean when I talk about real estate, I'm talking about the sector as a whole. 
and then we come into when i talk about property then i'm referring maybe to a certain building or i'm referring to a certain um three bedroom house somewhere else so that's what i'm referring to but real estate is very big i was actually telling somebody that graveyard plots now are being sold for profits and it's all part of real estate it's part of real estate when people go to vacations and they go to hotels it's all part of real estate somebody's making a profit out of that so yeah. real estate is everything that we know life as it is it all revolves about around real estate mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and um so for those who are you know, out when, there when it comes to um yeah over to you tendani oh okay um i was just saying that you know to in the in the township um mostly like okay in townships like um that are home soweto shawela and all that nobody was used to buying properties you know it was houses that were built you know so many years ago and when you introduce yeah. yourself to say you can buy a house the response yeah. at that time how was it and you know how do you how do you make them understand that once you buy this this is yours it's, you know it's not going to belong to so and so okay i think everything starts with education consumer awareness i think one thing that i'm passion passionate about even now is education so what i did was that each and every time that i sat with the first thing that i did it was not to sell them a house it was first to understand where they are and what they want to achieve and then i will then educate them about what the process is all about their rights things that they need to know even if i don't have to tell them but i used to tell people okay these are your rights so that you know what you're getting yourself into so i think educating people made people to to understand that when you buy a house you're not only buying yourself you're buying it for generation when you buy that house you are actually creating wealth that's what i always tell people so it's not about just brick and mortar it's more than that when you buy that house every time when you're sleeping the value is appreciating so the education was has always been my focus each and every person that i meet even now the first thing when we meet we talk about education where you are what you don't know what you need to know and what i'm expecting you to know after our engagement moving forward what you can teach the next person even if i'm not there and and tell me how is competition in the township no no in general in the sector in the industry the sector is tough and this sector is ruthless <laughs> i thought the taxi industry was dangerous but real estate i think it's just the same uh there's a lot of sabotage you just have to be strong that's all i can say but it's a really tough industry to be in 15 years into this industry i it still feels like i've just started because challenges come in different ways so it's a really tough industry but it's what, worth what, are the sort, what are the sort of things that make it tough i think it okay it, I, I think it would depend the space that one wants to operate in uh when i was selling properties in the township it was easy because uh, my competition were people who were just like me. And then when I moved into uh, buying houses on auction, the game started to change because obviously the profit margins are not the same. I'll give one instance whereby there was a particular time whereby I went on auction to buy a house. And in an auction, they're always, uh, we call them uh, ring leaders. So on that particular day, I actually, outbeat this particular guy and he really wanted that house two weeks down the line after i've just paid off that house at the attorney the house was bent down so meaning that i've bought a house but it's bent down so meaning i have to rebuild it again 
those are the type of challenges I'm talking about. And after that, I started uh, moving into buying lands to develop. And obviously, when you buy lands to develop to what we to build what we call back rooms, but with the room, challenges are also even higher because then you are you are operating on a different level. So I think challenges they come into at the level that you are. At the lower level, it's okay, it's not that difficult. But the higher you go, the more difficult it gets. As a woman, firstly, number one. As a, as a black person, number two. You know, I don't know how many. Um, uh, but let me not mention this. But I, I'm just saying, as a black person, it's just difficult. Wow, Michael, you know. Uh, you know, like looking at uh, the, the the industry, I thought it's very peaceful. Like from where I'm sitting, I don't know much about mm -hmm. the industry, but I thought it's the most peaceful industry. But that yeah. comparing it into a tech industry where people are brutally killing each other yeah. for their lives and other things, I never thought it could be like that, even into property as well. Like uh, it, it's so unlike it, really, to be. I no man, that, that's very scary. Yeah, I don't know, but I'm talking about my experiences. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, about like, my experiences. Yeah, but but my understanding, I guess maybe we need to put it in perspective. I don't think she means that uh, from the killing that you are referring to. I, I think she's talking about the complexities of issues you deal with. Am I right, uh, Martin? That because every business has got its own challenges and difficulties. I think the the issue of where people now compete uh, violently; those are extremes you find in every business. But I think I think what I hear her saying is that people go all out, do everything possible just to be the ones that get the opportunity. Am I right? Uh, That's Martin? correct. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. But it doesn't and mean that so, people can't come. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I I just never uh, expected this kind of a sabotage that is happening in the industry. That's the part where I never expected it at all. Yeah, there's a lot of sabotage in the in the industry. Um, but I think as you as you as you grow into this industry, it becomes part of the game that people sabotage a lot in this industry. And um, just referring to one instance, there was a time where I uh, in 2018, whereby there were armed robbers in my house. I thought it was just an act of violence, just only to learn that that was actually an organized crime where somebody felt hired a hitman because they felt that I was taking business out of, out from them. I was stealing their clients. So it's wow. that brutal. Mm, that, that is very very brutal. So like That's tell me, brutal. tell me like looking at. Uh, people that sell the vacant land. We, we have got a lot of scams there on people that sell a vacant land. How can you advise somebody who wants to buy a vacant land? Like to what, what, what criteria or what, what kind of points to look at not to fall for scams? Okay, firstly, if you, are, you, are you referring to the municipality vacant lands? Simply, exactly. Let's, let's make it to municipal vacant lands because that's the one that are dominant in the townships. Okay, what I know is that um, some of the municipality lands actually they are under Eco Guleni, but they are actually owned by a company called Urban Dynamics, who used to do township development for Katohong and all of those areas. And I know that there's a couple of lands that I bought from this company, which actually were still under Eco Guleni. So if you want to buy a, a land that belongs to a municipality, you need to go to the property section of the municipality to verify that is it under a private person or under the municipality. If it's under municipality, they will tell you that they're waiting for auction, but uh, that's the only way you need to take the address and then do your research first before you can buy buy anything. But I know but when I bought a um, few plots in Gatleho, we actually bought it from this particular company, but however, the lands were under a Kuguleni, but the power to sign off those lands were sitting with that company. 
All right, okay. So in other words, even if the, the land is still under municipal, the municipality will also still guide you that you can still buy it from that company or because I believe that when they set check on their system, it will show that it's owned by them. So in that process, like how do we go about now to make sure that now it's no longer under municipalities, under this other company and to follow all those protocols? The municipality section, those are people who will be able to give you the right answers. So if it's a land that is 100% owned by Ekuruleni, they will let you know. If it's a land that is still under Ekuruleni, but the powers are sitting with another company, like this particular company that was doing a township mm -hmm. development, they will let you know. But you will have to contact that particular company and see if they are willing to sell or not. But I do know that this company called I think it's Urban Dynamics. They own a lot of lands in um, some are in the Everton Orange Farm and also some of uh, Ekuleni. Great. Let's uh, let's welcome our colleagues uh, Ruben Rambuta, another entrepreneur, joining us, and of course uh, Akona Diguza. We we are in conversation with Mate Mushweshwe of uh, Mushweshwe Properties. We are being inducted into this industry, which, uh, as Maynard has said, it looks so innocent from a distance. And Matthew was saying it is not as as easy as it looks. It is tough industry. So, so if we if we could, I want us to continue on that because the whole idea is to understand the, the dynamics of the sector because it's a very big sector, and and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who wants to go into the sector. The idea is not to scare people. The idea is to inform That's people true. about the issues and the challenges. And I think we need to be measured in the way we articulate these issues because I will yes. tell you also, in my industry of coaching, there are challenges. I sure. work, I spend sleepless nights preparing for sessions with my clients. Every industry has got its own challenges. So I think this is perspective. We want to learn from Mate so that people can can want to be like her. Ruben, welcome, my brother. I know you were on, the, on a trip to far north, further north than where you are. Uh, just a few ways of uh, introduction and uh, the type of business you are in so that Mate and our viewers can get to know you better. Ruben, are you with me? Okay, it looks like Ruben's connectivity is uh, failing him. Uh, Tendani, the, uh, Ruben, are you back? Are you there? Now, Ruben's connection is failing him. Tendani, uh, I see you listening very attentively. That's something different to uh, art and culture business. Uh, what are, what is going through your mind having heard what you have heard? Okay. Uh, 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 everybody is struggling to, with the connection, but yeah, I, 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 as I was trying to say a few the, the main that uh, I think uh, what I'm hearing uh, Marte say is that you're not just going to walk into this industry and people are just going to say welcome and they're just going to open the mm. space for you. Basically, it, it requires some, 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 some hard work. And you talk, you spoke about partnerships. What sort of partnerships are those that you feel are necessary for this industry, for you to function in the industry? Okay, in terms of partnership, you definitely need to have um, some sort of a very good um, funder and when i say yeah. funder yeah. that somebody whereby when you get a good deal you can always go there to maybe an angel investor let me put it that way you need to have a very good angel investor on your side you need to have a very good attorney on your side and then you need to have a very good bank consultant on your side so that's sort of like your power team because that for for the business to function you obviously need financial resources. And then you need somebody who can draft your contracts and look at your contracts so that you know what you're getting yourself to. And then you need somebody who can be able that when there's something whereby maybe you need to present a, an offer to the bank, 
they can get it immediately and you can get the feedback quickly especially if you are doing uh, houses flipping houses when you flip houses you actually want to make sure that your turnaround time is less than 90 days because you don't have time to hold it, that asset for long you want to buy and flip it and move to the next deal so you need a very good uh, bank consultant and you also need to, to get a good funder so that if there are delays in terms of flipping somebody can also uh, be able to help you with the guarantees so a good funder wow. is very important explain to us what flipping houses mean so basically flipping houses there's two types of flipping houses which i have done and i'm still doing the other the first one is when you buy at the auction so when you buy at the auction you will you are required to pay the deposit and within 21 days you need to pay the guarantees to an attorney and then you need to pay the municipality bill and then you need to make sure that you might you, hopefully you don't have to do eviction but if there's an eviction required you need to have money and you need to have a good lawyer in that cycle and then you need to have a client that already qualifies for that property you need to have a good construction guy who's going to help you with the renovations so all of that they work together ideally you want to flip the property less than 90 days if it's more than 90 days then it's going to start costing you money so that's the first part of doing it and then there are deals that i do whereby i buy i buy properties but without using my money so what happens is that i get a maybe a, a seller who wants to get out of a deal or maybe they're in financial distress and all they want is to settle their bank loan we then enter into an agreement i buy the property from them and then immediately i sell it to somebody else and in that time what's in between is my profit so it's, it's like uh, buying properties using other people's money wow. so those are two types of flippings yeah ruben you are my brother i don't know whether you can hear us you are an accountant uh, this must be saying something to you uh, if you heard what uh, Mati is saying help us unpack it a little bit more from an accountant point of view We're not winning with Ruben. You are, you are, the speed of your internet is a bit uh, slow and we can't, we, we can't hear you or you probably can't hear us. Now, uh, while we're waiting for Ruben to come in, can we talk about transformation in the industry? You must be one of the very few blacks in the industry and one of the very few women owning this business. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Okay, there's a lot of us in that who are actually running a property business. So, but however, when we talk about transformation, basically for me, my understanding of transformation is to get at a level whereby, or oh, what we're trying to achieve is that there should be a company that can be like Pam Golding. Let's put an example. When you look at the brand like Pam Golden, you're looking at a brand that is international. You're looking at a brand that can sell. Is anybody here? Are we online? Yeah, we're hearing you. Carry on. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So when we talk about transformations that we're trying to to be like the next Pam Golding, the next Remax, that's what we need. We need a company that can be franchised and it can just be all over the township. Currently, we don't have a company like that. We don't have a, a company that you can find the same brand in Zagane, Soweto. You go to, to Peter Marius Bank, you can find a company like that. That's what we need. We need a black company that can represent black people across the country and internationally. That's what we need. And part of that is that one of the barriers into the industry is that we come from a background whereby firstly to be able to franchise a company is expensive on its own. Because now you need to submit your processes, they need to vet it and make sure that the company that you have can can does it qualify to become a franchise. That's point number one. Point number two is the resources. 
we don't have those resources whereby one person can open one business and branch out to throughout the country you need to have other partners in the business who can be able to support you we also want to own buildings we want to own hotels we want to be listed on 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 uh, jse that's the type of transformation that we need to see in this industry so for me transformation is all about acquiring assets because that's the only way you can be able to create wealth is to acquire those assets is to own those buildings is to have the biggest property manager that can manage uh, uh, student accommodations those are the opportunities that black people can still not compete in, in spaces like that we need a company that can develop like cosmopolitan to this day cosmopolitan is still the only company that's developing in the township we don't have a black company with that kind of capacity so that's a transformation that we need access to land we need to own lands because when you own land then you can develop because you've got the power so that's what we need right now am i understanding you saying that uh, the the there is a need for us to go in the other related fields of uh, real estate and one of those you're saying is the development yes yes development in, remember when you talk about that we have primary real estate and we have what we call a primary market and then we have what we call a secondary market so a primary market is actually where you develop and then you sell off plan once you have sold off plan when that buyer or that seller is selling to somebody else is now a secondary market but where you make your money and where you make the impact is when you are actually developing mm. development mm. you need development because when you have develop when you do development you need access to lands so meaning that you can buy if you have the capacity to to buy a huge plot rezone it into a township establishment build houses build a uh, uh, townhouses inside you can actually balance the two whereby you are selling and at the same time you are building stock for rental because that's what other big companies are doing they will sell and they will also retain to lease out so that's what we need wow a minute i actually I'm tempted to encourage uh, Mate to write a book or a manual of how <laughs> to enter into this industry, uh, Mate, because it looks like those are the must know aspects yeah. of the industry yeah. and options. Yeah. Uh, because it, it, it looks like it's complex, but you so unpack it. Because there is a value chain, there's a value chain into this industry. So when you're an, an estate agent, you are at the bottom. You are at the bottom. At the top, you are talking to people who are owning buildings. You are talking to people who are owning malls. And then you come to people who are owning uh, uh, the finance structures of real estate. We are talking about people who are financing like Uber, you know, uh, Uber Finance. They're actually financing. It's a real estate company. It's a financing company which is owned by one of the white real estate business and then you come to people who are actually owning lands and they're developing and in that development they're also building rental stock and out of renting, re building rental stock they are then already um, circulating their money because then they will open another property management company and with that property management company then they also own the construction company so you understand mm. it's like a cycle so when you are selling at the secondary market, you are at the bottom of this industry. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this one I can say it, 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 it's becoming more complex, definitely, because it looks like the real uh, agent is just like again eyes on the tape. So there is a the whole honey hiding yeah. somewhere. And yes, there is. That's where, that's where we definitely need to dig. I mean, like uh, as a young entrepreneurs and even the upcoming real agent, I think that's where maybe people need to focus on on the development part of it. Because definitely, I've seen a lot of development. Most yeah. on, on on the development part, you only see 
uh, people of a color running around there yes. when, when, yes. when there's still a development. Then you will only see us like when now the structures are up. So I think yes. we definitely need to go back and see all the roots of this whole uh, property uh, development, where it's coming from, and we need to invest back on that. I think definitely we, we definitely look to look in, into development. It's so true because I actually uh, had a conversation with um, somebody at Nature, which is a, a, it's a company which is part of government and part of human settlement. And my, my conversation was that they have put so many barriers for black people to come into the development space whereby they will need experience, they will need this, they will need this, and maybe you don't have that, but you want to start. So the barrier to entry into that is very complicated. No, I can see. You know, like you mentioned something about the rezoning as well, of which is one of those other that processes as well, whereby you, you might even end up like not even following such particular processes because they are tedious exercises. I think they they also need money that rezoning processes as well. So I think we the resources is what we definitely need. Like yeah, definitely we need definitely need the financial muscle in everything. Yeah, you need money to 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 get into that space. It's 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 got a lot of rewards, but it's expensive. You're gonna spend a lot of money. Hmm. And then you wanted to come that, in. That really shows that there is. Yes, I okay. Uh, uh, Akona, you can hear us. I guess it's better now. I can see you, you are connected, and you're ready to go. Welcome. Yeah, so I so to say the, it clearly shows that, um, we cannot. Uh, you know, you know, uh, 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 Mate, as you were talking, I was busy actually scoping here what I will call the related industries. It looks like uh, you, you call them all real estate, but they are sub, sub industries yes. that, that, that they themselves on their own present opportunities. And I want us to reflect on that because it looks like for us as black people to enter the industry you're going to need this all these other industries to be ready yes. and you call them when you were listing them you call them your power team but i yes. added here to say you need legal companies to work with you True. you will need construction companies if you are in a development space to work with you True. you will need financiers to work with you which will be the True. banks and the, anybody then you will need investors, venture capitalists, yes. uh, yes. and angel angel investors, yes. and uh, which others? Uh, I mean, auction auctioneering is a sector on its own. No, it's yeah, it's a sector on its own, but it's part of real estate. Yeah. It's part of property. Yeah, but I think the one you mentioned are so important because you cannot do the other. You need all of those. So, the, will you advise? Will you advise if if I'm wanting to enter this industry and I talk to you and I know you do that a lot of talks, especially targeting at women to come into the sector because you see this is the way of creating wealth. But I can imagine the first talk with you will be let me give you the scope, let me give you the landscape, yes. and, and 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 if you were to give me logical steps at the very development phase of putting together an entity of my own. Yes. What will be the logical steps? Which which ones do I have to have lined up before I can say, pre go and print the flyers and sit stand in the corner and say, I'm now in the industry. Okay, you meaning as a, um, as a as property entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur. Okay, not, an, not, a, not as an estate agent, because that's something. Not well, an, I as want an to, agent. ultimately, I want to be a martyr. Okay. I mean, so for basically, you it happens, for you it happens that opportunities presented themselves, 
And then you evolved. You must have gone through a lot of pain because you yes. everything was happening for the first time for you. Yes. Now yes. you are a mentor and you are mentoring somebody who wants to go into the industry. And I just want to, I like this concept of logical steps because, because if you jump steps, you're going to hurt yourself. Now just take us through the logical steps from the point where you want to become a real estate to a point where you are a real estate agent. What are the logical steps you need to go through to put things in place? Okay, so I'm gonna actually uh, explain it in two ways. Uh, the first thing is that if you want to be an estate agent, with the new laws now, you are required to go and do an NQF level four. That's number one. Number two, you need to be so under a cover. It, uh, is NQF level four of what four. called? SAQA. It's NQF level four in real estate, SAQA 59097. Okay. That is the uh, qualification ID. And where is that offered? Well, I do have a company that I work with where we offer trainings. But however, there are other companies. There's Ditasa, there's Oxford. There's a lot of them on the internet that offer give, give, yours, give us yours because we want to tell them that we had the, of them from okay. you so that we don't have to oh, go to okay. so Yeah, there is a company that I work with. Uh, it calls a uh, Tina. It's a, it's a training company. So people who come to me, I refer them to that guy because I work with him. So um, I can share details later on. Mm -hmm. So that is that. And then you have to be going to work in a company for one year. But what I always tell people is that uh, as a new person coming to the industry, the most important thing is to get the right estate agent to mentor you. So you're going to have to look for somebody who, who's far ahead, who, who, who's got a lot of experience and who has achieved a certain level of success because they'll be able to mentor you through certain things whereby uh, an ordinary estate agent that might not be able to help you with. That's very important is to get the right mentor and is to get into a very good real estate company. You need to get into a very good real estate company that offers a lot of training, that's got a marketing capacity. Uh, so that's what I, I would advise uh, anybody to do if they want to become an estate agent. And Those I believe, are the Mate, steps that are needed. Yeah? Mate, I believe you are one of those best mentors we can also rely on, right? <laughs> no, I can mentor you, but... Um, the structure of my business is that uh, because I'm more focused on investment, so I wouldn't say I have a lot of estate agents on my on my business, no, because I deal mostly with assets. I deal with investment. All right, I see. And then the China company? To us. Tendani can go. Oh, okay. Um, I think we had a, a connection error before, but I, what I wanted to say was earlier on, um, it's about that we can't really talk about, I'm just taking you back, we can't really talk about the transformation because from where you're explaining, it seems like air, most doors are you know, closed and sealed in terms of lands that are available. And those that have the lands, those that have the properties, they're not really let go and it seems yeah. like the government as well as not playing their part or willing to say okay we are welcoming the new young groups to come and also yeah. play in this you know in the playground yeah. and once again i've That's also true. realized that uh, when young companies that are coming in young companies that are coming in uh, on real estate agent it takes them if you ask them how long did you really get to get into real estate agent like uh, buying flats you know you they will only get successful on buying units instead of getting the whole building and exactly. you know exactly. um, actually the yeah the, the auction was advertised uh, last night and by the time you got there you are standing your bidding and the property has already been bought you are just True. there you know to you know, for formality True. yeah I, I, I hear so, that, I hear that, but 
I hear that, Dandani, but I, I, before we can go to difficulties, I just want her to finish these logical steps because it's important to know what needs to happen first. Then, then we can then attend to the blockages that are in the system. You know what I mean? Uh, okay. so, so just hold it there, Tendani. I, I understand that, but I think the biggest mistakes we make is to rush to complain about the problems. What I want is that like, the, the logical steps are important so that you know what is the journey to get to where she is. Because she didn't have any mentor, she didn't have any guidelines. Once we know the journey, then we know where the blockages are, and then we can address those blockages at the right spot. If you don't mind, then, then we can just come back to that. The land issue is a bigger problem than just facing yeah. uh, frustration. Otherwise, we are going to, to not to land. I want you, you have gone through this, tell us the logical steps so that when we are coaching and mentoring people, they must focus on, if they haven't done certain things first, like NQFO, if you don't have it, in the terms of the new regulations, you can't even start. Yeah, sure. yeah, then. Sure. All right. So you obviously we need NQF level four. That is your qualification, uh, which is just give you an overview of what the industry is all about. You need to get yourself into a good company, but most importantly, which somebody never told me, get your financial literacy right. You know. When I started making a lot of money and I was the first millionaire in my family and nobody actually, I didn't even know how to, how to handle money, to be quite honest. And I did a lot of mistakes. I lost all of that money. I rushed into buying the biggest expensive car, which I later regretted. So get your financial literacy right. You need to understand that this industry will present to you opportunities to create wealth. But however, if you don't have your financial literacy right, you will make money and you will lose it and you'll still be broke. So you need to know when that money comes, how are you going to channel it to be able to build uh, what we call a safety net? Let me put it that way. So because in real estate, if you don't yeah. have a plan, it's not fair. I had a card which was repossessed. <laughs> because I didn't, nobody told me only, when you have this kind of money, this is what you need to do. I started padding, not working, not doing anything up until I felt like I felt like for after two years, and I had to rebuild my business again. Wow. So, Financial so, literacy is very important. So, so get your numbers so, right. Um, it looks numbers like right. in it looks like in your business. There are those who work from the briefcase because you are just a real estate agent. You know, you, you, you identify houses, you go and sell. And it looks like there are those who say, I want to establish a real estate enterprise. So what yes. are you of the two? <laughs> I want to build a, an empire for my, for my grandkids. That's where I am. That's what I'm heading into. And everything that I did, I wanted to match the standards of Pem Gordon, which I look up to. So I have offices in Rosebank and I have offices in Boxbeck. I strive to become a reputable business that has credibility. So I, I, I'm building an empire for my kids, for my grandkids. I'm building a legacy. That's where I am. Maybe Mate, like looking at how you are, you are, you are unpacking your empire. Uh, while you are establishing these offices between the Santin one and the Boxback one, were you looking at your market uh, clients that you okay, looking at maybe Boxback, you've got more clients, then you started to invest in office there. And the Santin one, you also had a lot of clients that side, or maybe you just located yourself in Santin looking at the people that have got money, where the people you know that you, you, you there is good investors that side or how did you locate your offices? Okay, so the Sentin uh, office actually came when I started uh, working overseas, when I started doing business in, in, in the real estate of Dubai. And then what I realized that when my partners came to South Africa, they couldn't come to Boxback, it's too far. Mm. And everything that we did was all revolving around 
incentive. And the kind of people who have the capacity to buy, they are all incented. So that's how that office came. And then the office in Boxbeck is closer to the township because I'm very passionate about the township because I think it's got a lot of, a lot of potential. And because I have um, what I call backroom business in the township, so that office is closer to the market that I'm servicing. Perfect. And it's also closer to airport for your clients. Eh? Yes. <laughs> it's very close. <laughs> it's very close. Tell us a bit of then. Okay. okay I'm I'm just, no, I just I just wanted to say that um um uh, the way Maynard was asking that how did he position you know the you know the, the, the two offices. Then I also remembered that you know what if you are aiming to, to go higher, you need to be in a correct position. You need to put you cannot true. have a true. client driving from the south of Dover to you know, going to the north. True. So I think true. Um, it's, true. it's what you are aiming at and uh, yeah. that will also work for you. True. I agree with you. And you know, the nice thing about being in around Sentin is that you meet a lot of entrepreneurs and being in that office, I have made a lot of business partnerships. A lot of them that people that I wouldn't have met, I met them at that office. So it was also strategically positioning my business very well. I've met a lot of people. I've made relationships outside of South Africa because of our just day, maybe at the right time, and I met the right people. So, yeah, you are right, uh, Tendani. In Sam, in my um, consulting services for medical drug foods, I used to assist them on uh, uh, buying and selling um, uh, medical practices. And you know, now today, because I've got a professional, she will tell me what was the dangers of doing that. Because when a medical doctor says he wants to buy a medical practice, most of the surgeries or medical practices they are not, they don't belong to the doctors. They are actually renting a space, but mm. when they move, they the, the the particular doctor wants to move away from there. He will rather say, "I'm moving to a different province, so I don't want to carry anything." You know, mm. I want to sell this space, mm. and he's basically selling. I always say he's basically selling um, uh, it files equipment actually that is inside. Mm. And I will go mm. ahead and assist them on finding fellow medical practices who want to occupy the space. And in some cases, what would happen is the doctor would want to move because he had that in the next two years, the building is going to be under a river. And he will keep it to himself and give us a different reason or give me a different reason to say, no, you know what, I'm actually moving to... Uh, if he's in Pretoria, for instance, you no, know, I want to move to the east, right? Not because he really basically wants to move, but he's running away from the fact that I'm going to lose out in the next few years when they're doing a revenge. Obviously, they're going to change the whole setup of the place. And you still go ahead, I still go ahead with selling the, um, what is it? It's a goodwill, basically. You know, you just sell a goodwill to the next uh, professional. And signing a contract, an agreement contract of selling what is inside, yeah. not the property. Mm -hmm. Two years then the line, the property is on, it's on a river. And you mm -hmm. are sitting with an agreement with the, the doctor saying to the landlord, you gave me a lease agreement for five years and two years down the line or three years down the line, here we are. What do we do then? Okay. It, okay, because so what it, happens? It, yes, you can go ahead. I was saying that if you are actually want to terminate your lease early, what I do you know you have to look at the contract that you signed. Some contract will say you need to give them two months' notice or you need to give them six months' notice because now I will assume this is a commercial uh, lease. Yeah. And obviously, some landlords will require you to actually they will charge you for them to advertise and to get another tenant. 
or they'll hold you accountable for maybe for the next two months while they don't have a tenant. So that is commercial, which I have to say, I don't have that much experience when it comes to commercial leasing. My area of expertise is all around residential because that's the sector that I'm focusing in currently. But a standard lease, you need to look at the contract and what the contract says. If the contract says you need to give them six months notice, you need to do that. If they say that they're going to want money from you, if they can't get a tenant, you need to know that. And another thing is that commercial also is, is not part of the rental tribunal. So it's something now, if there's any disagreement, you need to take it straight to court because mm. it's, it's not covered by the rental tribunal. Mm. Okay, I see that. Uh, because Everything they, uh, goes back to the contract. The contract. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what you signed. Wow. I, I, I guess what we were doing, we were just, you know, basically selling the goodwill of, you know, whatever the practice has. And the lease on its own wouldn't involve um, the owner of the building, but it will involve the managing company. Um, the managing company, I mean, the leasing company, uh, guys like, um, okay, City Property owns the, it's their property, but you would find the guys like Sanske and all that who are just managing the the rentals of, of, of the building, not basically them being uh, the owners. And when it comes to terms of renovating, you find that nowadays in another company that is managing to say, this is our building, we are deciding to, to do a renovation uh, in the next month. And you're already with the medical doctor who has signed five months, yeah, I mean, five years lease to say, I'll be here for five months. And you find that then, you know, the, the, the way they will follow or the way they will do things, they will just say it to you to say, here we are, we are the owners, we are renovating in the next 12 months. So, um, you know, move from from the space or find another space. We are not relocating you to a different place and you come back because when you decide to come back, you are now coming back at a brand new list completely, not as the same one that you had. They would, you know, discard the five year lease that you have an agreement with the administrator. Let me call them the administrator who are managing the business for them. And you are now stuck between the owner, the administrator, and the medical doctor wants to continue to practice and there is no space you know for him for that year if the building is going to take a year for for renovation so that's i've just learned that you know you it becomes so complex that uh the company that is administrating it's not really the owner of 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 the business per se or of, of the building per se a managing company is actually there to to offer a service to a tenant and to a landlord. Their, their, their role is to collect rent, pay levies, pay all the expenses, and then the difference they give it to the landlord. That is their service. But however, what you just said doesn't sound right because, because firstly, if they're going to renovate a building, they would have sent you probably a notice six months ahead. Number two, no landlord wants to be without an income. They rather move you into another office space, but to lose a complete income, it doesn't make sense because their yeah. business depends on the rentals. So yeah, I, I yeah. don't know why they did that. I'm, I'm not sure what was the reason behind, but from the story you're telling me, it just doesn't sound like those people. But you know, are, that, 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 is, that, is, that is exactly, I mean, you addressed this thing earlier on when you talk about uh, the, the, the partners. And in yeah. saying that, uh, if you are in, in contracts and you haven't got a strong legal uh, attorney with you, those become some of the risks that you, yeah. you are faced with. And yeah, I, and I think I think the the doctors the, the doctors are always finding themselves in this situation where sometimes they don't have a space because the the, the two parties that put together the thing they have now ended their relationship and. And you are right. If if you also don't have a, a, a contract that gives you not a opportunity in terms of notice in advance, then yeah. you are going to be in a very desperate situation. And and I sure. think it, it just shows yeah. that uh, yeah. in every yeah. business, one of the key things we must always keep in mind is 
have a legal legal person advising you yeah. and be aware of what you're signing yeah. signing up. So you were in a in a real estate business, then, mm -hmm. <laughs> or you were you were facilitating? Yeah, uh, I, I, mean, I, I think I was because you know what I would get properties and sell to 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 the guys and. I would just do things, you know, with contracts from from Google, and they will both parties will sign, and you know, everything will go well. And so far, I oh. only had one case like that, but all of them they went fine, and the top the the properties are still fine, they're still safe, the business are moving, and that's why I was I was I was asking about um, you know the procedures, the training, and all that because at some point I said, you know what. I need to learn about this. I need yeah. to know what is going on. What am I? Yeah. What am I doing? Yeah. I think okay. that's why this program is called Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Variety Show. We want to address every necessary aspect mm -hmm. of going into business, mm -hmm. and those are the blind spots, and those are not encouraged that you find yourself uh, having contracts done without legal people involved because yeah, it can true. be extremely, yeah. extremely. Exactly. You you don't want to do that. Uh, just get an attorney that can look at all your contracts because um, you don't want to find yourself if you start paying for things that you didn't even know about. So <laughs> that you don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't advise you to do that, honestly. I wouldn't advise you to do that. And you know what you can do? There are com law companies that offer contracts on a once-off. Maybe you pay them 200 they draft your contract. I actually forgot this company. They're based in Cape Town. When it comes to rental contract, they are willing to do it for you. You pay them 200, they draft it. It's a legal contract that is binding and then they do it in your business name. Very simple and very uh, cost effective. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can get I, things I think, like that. The takeaway for me from your, your the points you, you are addressing, Marta, is that let's let's encourage people to always make sure that there is somebody legal person next to you helping you where you involve other parties because it, it can be very very, very yeah, uh, that, that's a takeaway yeah. for me from the yeah. point you are yeah get a lawyer get someone to look at yeah. all your contracts exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah mm. i guess there's um there's always a learning point on everything you know and yes. on how it all started, you know, I was yeah, doing true. something else, and opportunity for me on the on the table, and yeah, it looked like it was moving fast, you know. And now you are here, so we know. Now I know a lot of um, things to be followed, you know, and, you know, you know, partners to have, you know, around, you know, transiting the the property sale. And that. Yeah, but. I think what I actually want everybody maybe that I want them to take away from this interview is that it's very important that we start building a property portfolio. Well, it's all good to 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 talk about being an estate agent and things like that because those expose what the industry is all about. But at the end of the day, we need to encourage women. We need to encourage young entrepreneurs. We need to encourage the young ones that. Buying a property is the best thing that you can ever do for yourself, especially Mr. Maisela, you are we'll go box back. And you know the township market is actually booming when it comes to rentals. So we need to be part of that. We need to be the people who are actually capitalizing on that market because I can see bigger companies are now coming into that space and they are building massive uh, flats around the township. And it will be so unfortunate that as the people we are not benefiting. So we need to also look into changing our mindset that this industry and our township, it needs to benefit us. Because the word township, it means undeveloped area. So it, the word township, it means an area which is not developed. So it's up to us who needs to develop it. And we need to be part of those people, you know? so. Owning a property is something that I want everybody, it's something I encourage everyone to do. Owning an investment property is important because your first investment property can open you up to buy a whole lot of more properties going forward. So wow. that's tell what I want. A, tell us, a, yes, Maynard. 
Yes. Yeah, no, in fact, like I wanted to conquer with her on the township market. I, I, I'm observing that. I see that happening. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity on that sphere. <laughs> Just like myself, I never looked deep into it, but I can see. Even you can see the rate at which the development is taking part here in Boxburg. It's so amazing. Is yeah. there is new development left, right, and center, and it's, sure. wow, it's really sure. it's motivating. I think definitely a property is an investment for somebody that he has to invest in. We have to, if it takes you to own maybe about five properties within the same area, let it be. Yeah, we need to start developing. We need ownership. It's very important. Ownership of real estate of property is important. Whether it's a land, it's a, it's a it, it's a it's a hotel unit, but you need to own an investment property, something that can create passive income. That this same thing, or it was you was asking me how did I survive during the pandemic? When the sector was closed, the only thing that made me to survive was rental income. Wow. It was mm. passive income. So creating mm. that passive income is so important. And what I would advise other people is that they shouldn't be like me you know um when you start building your 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 legacy and you're building your wealth i, I think driving an expensive car should be the last thing at the end. what really needs to matter is to build that portfolio you should be able to live off what your income passive can afford you to live so if your income passive income is ten thousand rent your lifestyle should be off 10,000 rand of that passive income. If you want to increase your lifestyle, it means you must buy more property so you can get more passive income so that you can increase your, your expenditure. It shouldn't be the other way around. So you don't go and get a credit. You should build asset that can give you income every month. If it's 5,000 rand, you need to teach yourself to live within that 5,000 rand of that particular passive income, but with the plan to grow it. So I think that's something that I really want young people to know that we rush into buying expensive cars and then at the end of the day, we get ourselves into debt. What needs to happen is that you need to build income. That income will then sustain you and then eventually you can get into those big expensive cars without even having to pay for it. That's very powerful, Mate. That's very powerful. You know, I used to tell most people that, especially these young upcoming generations, that myself, I can advise you to start with a property than to start with a car, really. I mean, I, looking at the, how the process of buying a property it is, the, a car process is just like a, it's an overnight process. It doesn't matter that yeah. one. But uh, buying a property is, it, it is a serious process that you should start with. Then you can buy a property tomorrow after you got your your, your house it doesn't matter what kind of a car you are driving as long as you've got the property that is very powerful yes. matter and i think most people they need to take note of that and then you know the future of is that once your 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 asset can prove that it's generating income you are able to use that income to buy another asset and then another asset then another asset that's how you build your portfolio but uh, yes, uh Please tell us uh, about the work that you do with women and also how you ended up be selling property in the Dubai market. Okay, which one should I start with? The Dubai market or the, the workshops? Well, I, I, I want you to address both. It's, it's your, it's your okay. choice. Okay, so the, the, the seminars that I do for women is that I've realized that there are a lot of ladies who are just like me, who are coming from Township Ekokatko home with no actually anyone who in the family who's, who has ever been an investor, who has ever been a millionaire. And then you start working and when you start working, you think that the first thing that you need to buy is a car. And then you probably maybe want to buy a townhouse, but for you to live in it, which is very expensive at times. So what I'm trying to teach women is that when you start getting an income that qualifies you to buy a house, the first house that I would advise you to do is to buy an investment property. And now coming to the township market, which has got a lot of opportunities. In the township, you can get a house that's worth 300000 
that has three outside rooms or four outside rooms for 300,000 rand. So if you take a loan for 300,000, which you are likely to pay about 3,000 rand or 2.9 or 3.2, depending on the prime rate. And then each room in the township, the current rate now is between 800 to 1.2, depending on who you are in a digital or what. So let's assume that you bought a house for 300,000 rent. It's got four outside rooms. Let's say each room is renting at 4,000 rent. And then the main house is a two bedroom house, which is renting at 2.5 to 3,000 rent. Meaning that your bond, it will be covered by the main house rental. The rest of the outside rooms, it will cover for rates and the rest is your passive income. You start there. And then, this money it needs to go into a separate account. You put it into it for about six months to a year. And then we go back to the bank. AFSA Bank has a program which they call buy to let, whereby they look at the asset that you have that is generating income. And then with that same um, income that is coming in, they refinance you for the next property, as long as you are buying a property which is going to be let out. Meaning that now you have two properties. And from there, you just take it like that. So meaning that the first house will pay it for itself. The second house will also pay it for itself. By the time you buy your third house, which could be your main house now, the other two assets will be financing your third house. I mean, you don't have to actually spend money from your pocket. So that's what I'm trying to teach young women that don't rush into buying a BMW, don't rush into buying a Golf 7, start small, Build it up, give yourself a three-year plan, build this thing. In three years' time, looking back, you will see that you have advanced and also now you have a portfolio and you have an income stream that comes every month. Your life is sustainable. You can start now making plans to buy a car or any other things you want to do. But your foundation needs to be correct. Mm. And and uh, are you are you able to share with us uh, how you got the opportunity to be involved in the Dubai or is it something that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Dubai property market actually came in twenty seventeen. So in twenty seventeen, I had an interest to take my money out of the country and put it in a different country, for different reasons. Obviously, to avoid income tax and to also to look at the exchange rate of money. So when I actually approached the guy who was helping me with that transaction, he then said to me that actually you can work and pay off this property because with them it's different. It's not like us. With them, you pay in installments. So it's more like rent to buy. So you pay a deposit. Once you get to 50%, the property gets transferred into your name. A tenant moves in, and then while they're moving in, they're paying you rental. The difference you must still pay, it, but the property is yours already. So he said to me that with your first deposit is fine, but with the second uh, payment that you need to do, if you can bring other people to buy what you have bought on this project, with the commission that you make, you'll be able to pay this particular unit. So that's how it came about. Mm. Oh, is it is it helping? Is it working now? Are you getting interest in that market from people? It's a difficult market, obviously. Um, the clientele that I'm getting is from uh, Indians. I mean, most of my clients who have bought for me, they are Indians. Uh, my black people, I think, when I'm talking about Dubai, they're thinking vacation, luxury, okay. going to travel. But when you look at the other nations, they can see the potential that what that country has because a, a dirham is pegged to a dollar. So their economy is very stable. And mm -hmm. also the rental market in Dubai is different from South Africa. It's a pro landlord market. In South Africa, we have a pro tenant market. Mm -hmm. Whereby here the law favors the tenant, whereas on the other side, the law favors the landlord. So uh, those are the benefits of that market. But obviously, uh, there are those people who see the benefit and there are those who don't see the benefit, who don't like the era. They think it's too hot. So it's, it's a preference. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. 
we we close to the top of the hour. I I want you to share with us uh, the top five topics and themes related to the real estate and property business that you think will benefit the viewers and listeners in the next couple of months if we were to handle hold a series on real estate conversations. If we don't have opportunity, we will always come back to you. But what are the top five themes you think will benefit people who are interested in the sector? Okay, firstly, I think the topic that I, I think people need to talk about is the backroom business. The, the township market and the backroom business that is booming right now. And how do people capitalize on that? And also looking at people, what they, I think people need to start talking about is that the sector itself has got a lot of opportunities in itself. So we can talk about the training and development in that sector because for people to be trained, they need to be a training provider. And currently, there aren't too many black training providers in real estate. Most of them are still people of color. So those are things that people need to talk about. How do people get into that space? And then let's talk about um, the sector in terms of um, property management, managing of assets in the township itself, so that those who are building these township uh, rooms, they should give opportunities to black entrepreneurs to manage those assets for them, because then it then helps, it boosts the, 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 the entrepreneurs and also help us to to transform the industry on its own. So we need to talk about property management. But I also want to talk about the issue of insurance within the sector itself. Let's talk about insurance in real estate. Somebody is capitalizing companies that are offering uh, insurance. Uh, there's something that we call rental insurance. Uh, people who are owning those companies are people of color. Where you are mean, people? You mean, you mean wise when you say the people of color? Yes, it's about because, white. Yeah, because I'm people of color will mean, people of color will will mean black. Okay, so you best white not people. About white people okay. only okay. those places. Yeah, uh, thank you for the correction. Yeah, um, uh, but Mahua, white white people. Yes. Uh, the, within the industry itself, there are insurances that are provided whereby a Mahua go na haulu a a a alimo spaces like rental insurance. The companies are offering rental insurance. The company Zamahua, you know. So basically, we're are, talking. So we're talking to that point I raised earlier on about transformation in the industry. Yes. And yes. in the South African context, it means that there are very few black people and women per se who are in yes. the ownership side of the industry, yes. right? Yes. Right. Yes. So, so I'll put transformation as one topic that we yeah. can look at. Wow. Great. Uh, uh, let me ask my colleagues if they have the closing remarks and last questions to ask in the next 10 minutes. Maynard and Tendani. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that the, um, the, the, the talks that you do with women, how often do you do and um, how, how broad are you, are you thinking of stretching it out? Because the talks you are giving, they, they are quite important. When you look at the peer pressure of young women who are getting into uh, the workspace or into the business space and you know, with the excitement that, you know, I've made my first 100,000 on the first week and then counting that, you know what, I'll have maybe 400,000 know, at the end of the month. I can afford a golf server. And you look at it, it will not only be in that home, it will not only be in the box tech area. So how are you planning to make sure that the talks reaches, you know, as much women, as much young women, even older women, some are struggling to grow out of, you know, being young and they keep on making the same financial mistakes, you know, nonstop. Okay, most of the time I get invited by um, event organizers. So if, um, maybe Department of Justice, they are hosting a, a woman event, especially around uh, August, they will invite me to come and talk. Uh, but however, what I used to do is that I used to hold seminars around the township whereby I would then invite, if the topic that I want to address is about property development, 
I will then invite companies that offer finance in that space. And then I will highlight the importance of buying a building or building a building from, from, from scratch and then have a, a service provider that offers finance. So I used to do that a lot in the township, but um, because of COVID, um, I haven't done it uh, last year. Probably I'll do it again this year. But however, this year, what I want to, to focus on is that women that who have taken my advice and who have actually now are property investors, I then want to give them awards in terms of those who have bought innovations, who have actually built beautiful rooms and now they've put Wi-Fi, they've made them to look more than and luxurious, then I want to award them. But that's what, this will be this year in August. I think I have to bring. I think I have to bring you into contact with a, 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 a kitchen building entrepreneur. So, oh. as you identify properties, there you can bring them in to come and build those beautiful kitchens. Yes, 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 yes. It will be a good synergy. It will be. It will be. It will be definitely. Mm, mm. I think you need to become our regular guest at this show. <laughs> I'll be glad. I'll be glad. Anything to share the information? Um, no problem. Yeah, I, I think those those five topics that you have you have shared with us, we need to bring you back to to address them. the no the problem. backroom business in the township. I like the fact that you are building the township economy, training and development in real estate. That will always be relevant. Yeah. You know. Uh, Property management in the township. Wow, what a new innovative way! You are basically saying that uh, the black people might set up companies in the township yes. and have yes. all these big rooms as yes. the accounts that they manage, yes. and manage, collect, yes. collect yes. rent, and make sure that the landlord receives payment. Yes, yes. Yeah? it should happen that way. Wow, it should I mean, happen I mean, that there, way. Must be some, there must be somebody sitting at the corner saying, "Hey, man, this is a, an idea." I already know so five landlords who are renting yes. out their back rooms. Yes. I'm going to be collecting rental for them and giving yes. my commission. Is that how you look and at it? It's exactly that way. Because remember, not everybody must be an estate agent. Some of people must be property managers. And there is a booming market right now in the township. If you go go so way to the lot of double story of rooms, who's offering those services? It has mm. to be the young people who are staying in the township who needs to provide those services. Wow. It's a business. And, and then and then once they build those, are the insurances uh, uh, covering the bedroom properties? That's what I was, I was actually saying that we need to start talking about that because now what I know is that they, in, I, I'm, I, 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 okay, let me put it this way. The first point is that how are those rooms developed? Number one, do they follow their bylaws? Very important. Number two, if they follow the bylaws, obviously you will need to insure them. After you have insured the structure, you need to insure your income as a landlord. But however, I had a debate with somebody that if you can insure the income of the landlord, we need to have a company that will insure the, the, the payment of the tenant Things like COVID that have happened have made us be aware that you cannot predict life. You can lose a job in 24 hours. So we need an insurance company that can start actually insuring rental income that if you lose your, your income, at least you have insurance to cover you for that. And these things are being done in, in the United States. It's not something new. In the United States, you can insure your, your income as a tenant. I wow. was actually been saying that in the United States, there is a qualification which specializes on affordable market, which for us will be the township market. We need a curriculum that will actually educate black people, young people about the township market because it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very nice. It, yeah, it is different. It's a, it's, a, it's a market that in a little RDP houses and all of those things, somebody needs to specialize in that market and they need to have a qualification in affordable market. So currently wow. the qualification only offers 
NQF level four, which is the broad thing about the industry. But when you go into other countries, people are specialists in the affordable market. Why can't we have it in South Africa? Beautiful. The last point that of number five was about transformation. That will be the last uh, topic to look at. Can, can we say uh, your last remarks, uh, Mate, and then Maynard, we have a very tight time left. One minute each, just to closing remarks, uh, because we get into the top of the hour. Well, I would like My, to say thank you so, so much yeah. for inviting me. Uh, it was nice to be here and to share uh, the knowledge, the little knowledge that I have. I'm still learning. I'm still a student of life. But um, if anybody wants to have ask me any questions, they can email me. My email is mate at driven prop dot Africa. Beautiful. Uh, Maynard? No, thanks so much, uh, Mate. We did learn a lot from you. Definitely, you should be invited again on the studio. Uh, one thing that I can also advise our fellow blacks that they are doing the back rooms is that they definitely need to follow the bylaws because you find somebody just erecting on the pipes and all those things, not following anything. And those houses, they end up not having a value. You know, even, even if a value evaluator can come, they can't value that particular structure. So following bylaws is, is the key. It's very, very, very important. Definitely. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your time and a lot of knowledge that you've shared. And I want to believe that with the talks that you're doing, you're definitely going to bring up powerful women in property and powerful women in the finance area. So we look forward from hearing from you. If you can share maybe your Facebook page or Instagram as well, so that uh, those who are going to hear we keep on following you and maybe you will drop some few hints, you know, about the industry and, you know, the do's and the don'ts. Okay, thank you. Hey. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you your Facebook page, your, your website address, you gave your email address, which is great, and the telephone number, if you don't mind. Okay, my number is 79 132 My Facebook page is my Temushwe my Instagram page is ntabi6797. My website is www.mushashaprops.co.za. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Don't go away. I'm just saying goodbye to our viewers, and we're still going to usher you out of our virtual studio in a oh. proper manner. Uh, great. Okay, this is the Applied uh, uh, Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Variety Show. We hold this show on the second uh, week of every month on a Wednesday, Wednesday, 1600 hours to 1800 hours standard South African. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you next time.